Greetings. I'm Diane Anderson, the youth pastor here at Pilgrim Church, and on behalf of our church community, I would like to welcome you this morning. So as a former elementary school teacher, I've always had an interest in children's picture books. I've got quite a collection of them at home. But since I'm no longer teaching and my own children are in their 20s, I haven't been adding to the book collection lately. Until this week, a new picture book came out that I just couldn't resist. Ibram X. Kendi, the author of How to Be an Anti-Racist, which is the book we'll be using for our church book discussion group in September, wrote this picture book. Anti-Racist Baby. I wish this book had been around when my children were little. It's filled with beautiful illustrations and offers wonderful guidance for parents and grandparents who want to raise, raise anti-racist children. There's one page in particular I'd like to show you. It's this one. It says, celebrate all our differences. Anti-racist baby doesn't see certain groups as better or worse. Anti-racist baby loves a world that's truly diverse. Anti-racist baby loves a world that's truly diverse. This message of celebrating differences and seeing everyone as worthy is a message that is central to our faith. Because our faith tells us that God loves a world that is truly diverse and that God claims each one of us as a beloved one. So on that note, I would like to welcome you here this morning with all of your differences. You are welcome here no matter what. No matter if you are black or white or brown. No matter if you are gay, straight, or bi. No matter if you are married, single, divorced, or widowed. No matter if you are cisgender or transgender. No matter if you are a Republican, Democrat, or any other political persuasion, no matter if you are wealthy or on a tight budget, no matter if you are employed or unemployed, no matter if you are sure of your faith or doubting your faith, no matter what, you are welcome here this morning. This is God's space and you are welcome as a beloved child of God. May the peace of Christ be with you this morning. Good morning, everyone. Welcome. My name is Ray Dearborn, and I am one of the deacons here at Pilgrim Church. I really enjoyed being back deaconing for last Sunday's service, and in the days that followed, my family and I realized just how much we miss our Sunday mornings here, being with all of you in person, in this sanctuary, worshiping and fellowshipping together. But I am so thankful that we have this technology to keep us connected during this time. I am certainly looking forward to when we are all back together in person, but in the meantime, I hope and pray that you are all staying healthy and safe wherever you may be. Now please hear the call to worship. If you are tired, come and worship. If you are hungry, come and worship. If you are filled with joy, come and worship. If your spirit feels renewed, come and worship. Our God desires our worship, whether we have much or little to give. There is healing when we come before our God. All who are gathered here, come and worship.
Sisters and brothers in faith, Jesus modeled for us a life of humility and love and calls us to follow his example. Where have we fallen short of being Christ to the world this week? Let us confess our sins together. O oh God, you search after us when we have gone far from you. Yet we confess that at times we become consumed with our own affairs. We can forget to pause to listen for the wind in the trees or hear the happy voices of children. Sometimes we feel that the burdens of the world fall entirely on our shoulders and we can be slow to put our trust in you or to cooperate with others. When we take ourselves too seriously, remind us that we are only human. Make us patient with our mistakes and more forgiving toward our neighbor. And remind us that we are precious, not because we are good, but because you have accepted us and called us to be your very own. Amen. Sisters and brothers in faith, love knows no bounds. Hope knows no bounds. Peace knows no bounds. And faith knows no bounds. There is no place you can go where God is not there. There is nothing you can do that can separate you from God's love. As forgiven ones, May you bring hope and peace. May you live into faith. May you be love. Amen. Let us now join our voices together to pray the prayer Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespassed against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We will now move into our time for a children's message. Over the past two weeks, we have been talking about ways to connect with God. Two weeks ago, Angie Johnson, our Director of Christian Education, talked about ways to connect with God out in our own backyards. And then last week, she talked about connecting with God when we're at the beach. Well, today we will talk about how we can connect with God when we are in the forest. There are so many beautiful hiking trails here in Sherburne and in the surrounding towns. I'm guessing that quite a few of you have been out exploring some of the local forest trails this summer. I have some great trails right by my neighborhood and I walk on them almost every day. Sometimes I walk at a pretty fast pace and am really just trying to get exercise, but there are other times when I go into the woods because I want to spend quiet time with God. I have a friend who has taught me a lot about how to spend time in the woods with God. She taught me how to slow down and take in all of the sights the sounds and the smells of nature. When I'm hiking in the woods with my friend, we listen to the leaves rustle in the breeze. We look up to the sky and watch a barred owl fly overhead. We feel the soft moss growing on a log and we smell the fresh earthy scent of the pine grove. As I take in the beauty of the forest like this, I offer a prayer of gratitude 
to God. I also take a moment to offer a blessing to the forest. I say to all of the plants and the animals in the forest, may God protect you and keep you safe. May you continue to flourish and grow. May we humans treat you with kindness and respect. I'm so glad that my friend taught me to use all of my senses to appreciate nature and to take time to give thanks to God for the gifts of the forest. So I'd love for you to meet my friend this morning Let's see if she'll come up and say hello. <laughs> this is my canine friend, Callie, and my daughter, Catherine. We recently adopted Callie from Schultz's Guest House, which is a rescue shelter in Dedham. Callie is still a puppy. She's about 10 months old, and she's part beagle, part husky, part golden retriever, and a few other things. And one of the things I appreciate most about Callie is the way she teaches me to pay attention to nature and to use all of my senses to enjoy God's beautiful creation. So thank you, Callie for being such a great walking companion. And thank you, Catherine, for making it possible for Callie to be here this morning. <laughs> Our scripture reading for today comes from the Gospel of Mark, chapter seven, verses one through eight. 14 and 15, and 21 through 23. And I will be reading from the Common English Bible translation. Listen now for the word of God. The Pharisees and some legal experts from Jerusalem gathered around Jesus. They saw some of his disciples eating food with unclean hands. They were eating without first ritually purifying their hands through washing. The Pharisees and all the Jews don't eat without first washing their hands carefully. This is a way of, of observing the rules handed down by the elders. Upon returning from the marketplace, they don't eat without first immersing themselves. They observe many other rules that have been handed down, such as the washing of cups, jugs, pans, and sleeping mats. So the Pharisees and legal experts asked Jesus, why are your disciples not living according to the rules handed down by the elders, but instead eat food with ritually unclean hands? He replied, Isaiah really knew what he was talking about when he prophesied about you hypocrites. He wrote, this people honors me with their lips, but their hearts are far away from me. Their worship of me is empty, since they teach instructions that are human words. You ignore God's commandment while holding on to rules created by humans and handed down to you. Then Jesus called the crowd again and said, Listen to me, all of you, and understand. Nothing outside of a person can enter and contaminate a person in God's sight. Rather, the things that come out of a person contaminate the person. It's from the inside, from the human heart, that evil thoughts come. Sexual sins, thefts, murders, adultery, greed, evil actions, deceit, unrestrained immorality, envy, insults, arrogance, and foolishness. All these evil things come from the inside and contaminate a person in God's sight. Here ends the reading. Thanks be to God for his holy word. This is the third and final Sunday of our three-week Sunday at the Movies sermon series. 
Each week, we've been exploring how the theme of a contemporary film relates to a particular Bible passage. The three movies in the series were chosen because each of them highlights a virtue that is central to our Christian tradition. As we all continue to live through challenging times, these three virtues can inform the way we navigate the days ahead. They can help us stay on the path God intends for us, even as the world around us feels out of control. Today's movie is Patch Adams, and the virtue is compassion. Last week, we discussed the movie Black Panther and the virtue of courage, and the week before that, we discussed the movie A League of Their Own and the virtue of commitment. If you missed the first two sermons in the series and would like to hear them, you can find the YouTube links by going to the church website, pilgrimsherburn.org. Commitment, courage, and compassion, three virtues we are called to embrace as followers of Jesus. So let's turn now to our third movie and the virtue of compassion. Are you a rule breaker? Were you the kind of kid who spent lots of time in the principal's office because you just couldn't abide by the school rules? As an adult, do you follow rules? Rules at work, rules on the road, rules at the airport. Our society has lots of rules. Are you a rule follower in general or a rule breaker? I've always pretty much been a rule follower. The principal's office seemed like a scary place when I was a kid, so I did everything in my power to avoid being sent there. And as an adult, I keep pretty close to the speed limit, and I count the items in my grocery cart to be sure I'm under the limit before getting in the express checkout lane. I suppose I find a kind of comfort in knowing the rules and following them. Most of us generally tend to think of rules as a good thing. But in both the movie and the scripture reading today, rule breaking is actually encouraged. The main character in the movie Patch Adams is a big time rule breaker. In this 1998 movie, which is based on the true story of a man named Hunter Adams, nicknamed Patch, who is played by Robin Williams. After struggling with a bout of depression, Patch voluntarily admits himself to Fairfax Hospital's psychiatric ward. There he becomes acutely aware of the cold and overly clinical methods used by the ward's doctors to treat patients. Patch attempts to comfort his fellow patients with humor and kindness which angers the doctors. In one lively scene, Patch comes to the aid of his psychotic roommate, Rudy, by entering his imaginary world. Patch creates a bunker from a metal bed frame to protect Rudy from an attack of invisible squirrels. And then in another key scene, one of the patients, a brilliant philanthropist, named Arthur Mendelssohn, shares an important pearl of wisdom with Patch. Arthur encourages Patch to look beyond the ordinary. He says, see what no one else sees. See what everyone else chooses not to see. See the whole world anew each day. Well, this pearl of wisdom ignites in Patch a kind of calling. He checks himself out of the psychiatric ward and enrolls in Virginia Medical School with the goal of becoming a completely different kind of doctor from the ones he's experienced. A doctor who treats the whole person 
instead of just the disease. A doctor who uses the power of laughter to heal. A doctor who offers patients both medical care and compassion. Patch shocks the other medical students with his goofy antics and his willingness to challenge authority figures. He breaks all kinds of rules and regulations as he performs unconventional acts of compassion when treating patients. In one scene, Patch uses a hospital enema bulb to make a big red clown's nose, which he puts on to delight children who are receiving cancer treatments. Many of the other doctors who strictly adhere to the rules and regulations of the hospital find his behavior to be inappropriate and unprofessional. And Patch is nearly expelled from school because of his rule breaking. In one moving scene, he makes a passionate plea to, to the state medical board to adjust their rules. If we're going to fight a disease, Patch says, let's fight one of the most terrible diseases of all, indifference. You treat a disease, you win, you lose. You treat a person, I guarantee you always win, no matter what the outcome. The professors you respect, the ones who aren't dead from the heart up, share their compassion. Let that be contagious. Patch envisions a place where medical care is provided with no titles, no bosses, a community where joy is a way of life, where love is the ultimate good. He eventually goes on to establish an alternative health care facility called the Gesundheit Institute. Patch Adams broke the rules for all the right reasons to widen the circle of compassion. Now, in our scripture reading for this morning, we encounter another rule breaker, Jesus. Here we see the religious leaders in Jerusalem gathered listening to Jesus. They notice that some of Jesus' disciples are eating food without having first completed the purity cleansing ritual. The leaders question Jesus about why his disciples aren't concerned with following this ritual one that has been passed down by the community elders. And Jesus, much like Patch, makes the case that these leaders have become too caught up in the rules and traditions and have left out the humanity. Jesus clarifies to the leaders what is important to God. It is the intentions of the heart rather than the strict observance of purity rituals that God is concerned with. Jesus, in this example and throughout his ministry, also broke rules for all the right reasons to widen the circle of compassion. It is part of human nature to look to rules regulations, and customs for a sense of security and for a way of organizing our communities. But sometimes rules can create hierarchies in which people feel either superior or inferior. Rules can become a means of oppression and exclusion. They can become morally rigid. Our human rules are important and mostly helpful. However, they are not always aligned with the commands of God, the commands to love God and to love our neighbor. Now, I'm by no means suggesting that when this service ends, we all head out and start breaking a bunch of rules. But perhaps when this service ends, we find time in the coming week to reflect on some of our own unwritten rules and customs. Are there any ways that 
we typically interact with others that prevent us from widening our own circle of compassion? According to psychologist and meditation teacher Tara Brock, there are three roadblocks we need to be aware of that can prevent us from widening our circles of compassion. The first roadblock has to do with where we place our attention. Many of us tend to pay lots of attention to our friends and family, but very little attention to those outside our own inner circle. People outside our inner circle can become what's called neutral others. To widen our circle of compassion, we must deepen our attention to these neutral others. When we encounter people outside our circle, we could take just a moment to ponder, I wonder what it would be like to be you. I wonder what it would be like to be you. This simple practice is a way of opening our hearts to those around us. The second roadblock to widening compassion has to do with hierarchy. Society conditions us to see some people as superior and some as inferior. And we can buy into this hierarchy without even realizing it. If we believe that we are somehow superior to others, whether because of their race, gender, income, sexual orientation, appearance, or level of education, our heart isn't fully open to them. And the third and final roadblock to widening compassion is fear. We can be afraid to take in the suffering of those around us. But to have compassion for others, we need to actually allow the suffering in. The important thing, however, is that we don't let that suffering just settle inside us. When we take in the suffering of others, we then need to find a way to release it. One way to do this is to offer it to God in the form of prayer. By letting the suffering of others touch our hearts in this way, we are often then compelled to act. Both Jesus and Patch Adams broke rules to overcome these three roadblocks to compassion. In doing so, they deepened their attention to those who could have been seen as neutral others. They disregarded society's hierarchy of worth, and they opened their hearts to the suffering of those around them. They broke rules for all the right reasons to widen the circle of compassion. What unwritten rules, social conventions, or cultural norms might we be called to break so we too can widen our circle of compassion? Well, for the moment, Patch has inspired me to break my own unwritten rule about not making a fool of myself. Didn't someone once say that laughter is the best medicine? Amen.
Will you come and follow me if I but call your name? Will you go where you don't know and never be the same? Will you let my love be shown? Will you let my name be known? Will you let my life be grown in you and you in me? Will you leave yourself behind if I but call your name? Will you care for cruel and kind and never be the same? Will you risk the hostile stare? Should your life attract or scare? Will you let me answer prayer in you and you in me? Will you let the blinded see if I but call your name? Will you set the prisoners free and never be the same? Will you kiss the leper clean and do such as this unseen? And admit to what I mean in you and you in me. Will you love the you you hide if I but call your name? Will you quell the fear inside and never be? the same? Will you use the faith you found to reshape the world around? Through my sight and touch and sound in you and you in me. Lord, your summons echoes true when you but call my name. Let me turn and follow you and never be the same. In your company I'll go where your love and footsteps show. Thus I'll move and live and grow in Thank you, Will. As we come together for prayer this morning, we will be trying something a little bit different. We will begin with what's called a loving kindness meditation, and then we will close with a prayer. The loving kindness meditation is a spiritual practice designed to widen one's circle of compassion. Once we've tried this meditation practice together, I encourage you to try it again on your own sometime. As I guide you through the practice, I will be asking you to engage both your heart and your imagination. You are invited to close your eyes if you like. Let us now come together for a time of meditation and prayer. I invite you to begin this loving kindness meditation by offering a blessing for yourself, 
recognizing that you are a beloved child of God who deserves blessings. In your mind, say to yourself, may I be safe. May I be happy. May I be healthy. May I feel God's unconditional love. Next, bring into your mind someone who has been loving and kind to you. A person or perhaps a companion animal who makes you feel safe and whole. Someone you love. There may be more than one who fit this description, but for, for now, just focus on one. Imagine the one you choose is sitting right in front of you and you are looking at them. Picture this chosen one in your mind's eye. And as you do this, try to get in touch with the genuine feelings of care and compassion you have for the one in front of you. Now, as you look at this chosen one, who is also a beloved child of God, say to them, May you be safe. May you be happy. May you be healthy. May you feel God's unconditional love. Next, picture someone you see regularly but don't know very well. Maybe a cashier at the grocery store, a healthcare worker, or a service provider. Someone who is in your life, but who you don't know very well personally. Picture this person, remembering that they are a beloved child of God, and say to them, may you be safe, may you be happy, may you be healthy, may you feel God's unconditional love. And now, if you feel comf comfortable enough, you can try extending these blessings to someone who has been difficult in your life. Not necessarily the most difficult person in your life, but someone for whom there's been some sort of frustration or misunderstanding. Even if it may be difficult, there's value in noticing what it's like to offer blessings to this person, even as you recognize that you are not condoning their actions, but simply seeing them as one of God's beloved children. As you picture this person, say, may you be safe, may you be happy, may you be healthy, May you feel God's unconditional love. And now, imagine those who are part of your family of faith. Those from this church who, during normal times, sit in these pews. Picture these beloved ones in your mind. Maybe you can picture them sitting in the pews with you. Look around the sanctuary at their faces and give each of them a loving smile. As you look around at the church, at all of God's beloved children, say to all of them, may you be safe, may you be happy, may you be healthy, May you feel God's unconditional love. And now, extend the circle of blessings way out to include all beings of this world, all who suffer due to cruelty, violence, poverty, illness. 
Let your circle of blessings extend so that all of God's beloved ones may be included. As you imagine this planet and all of life, say, may you be safe. May you be happy. May you be healthy. May you feel God's unconditional love. And now, as this loving kindness practice comes to an end, take a moment to appreciate and feel what's been generated. And even if there have been difficult parts of this practice, know that this practice has the potential to increase your sense of compassion and of belonging and your awareness of God's unconditional love all around you. Let us close with a prayer. God of mercy, we ask that you bless all of those who entered our hearts and minds during this meditation. Hold each of them in your loving embrace and let them feel your unconditional love. God, we also ask that you help us continue to widen our circle of compassion so that we are able to spread your love throughout our hurting world. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. And now, as we come to this time for the offering, you are invited to contribute to the ministry of Pilgrim Church by going to our website, pilgrimsherburn.org, where you will find a donation button. We are deeply grateful for all the contributions which help us to continue to do God's work here at home and out in the world. Let us now join together in singing the doxology.
And now for our benediction. Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers. As you go from here this week, pursue peace. Be slow to anger, abounding in love. Be filled with gentleness, grace, and forgiveness. Let love and compassion of Jesus flow through you to all you meet. Go now in peace. Amen.